the movie that was made possible due to leaked test footage, the film that movie critic Roger Ebert called the best superhero movie he'd ever seen. Keep watching as we rank every non-MCU Marvel movie. Warning: This video contains fast, flashing images. Viewer discretion is advised, especially for those with photosensitive epilepsy. 2005's Man-Thing was produced as part of an executive deal Marvel made with Artisan Entertainment to produce a number of films based on their comics. Thankfully, the dreadful Man-Thing was the only one made before Artisan was acquired by Lionsgate. Based on the 1970s supernatural monster comic, Man-Thing tells the story of Ted Salas, a man who becomes one with a mystical swamp. But the effects were poor, the cast was unimpressive, and it failed on basically every level, especially the decision to turn him from a hero into a horror movie monster. Even notorious Marvel producer Avi Arad was said to have lamented the foreign production, telling Wizard Magazine that on seeing the result, I thought, Shit, I can't believe this. The 1990 adaptation of Marvel's iconic hero Captain America was originally intended as a big-ticket summer blockbuster, announced with a thrilling theatrical poster. Instead, it was a goofy, cheap-looking movie that lacked all the excitement and action it aspired to. On the positive side, the Captain America costume was a pretty faithful adaptation of Cap's glorious red, white, and blue uniform little head wings and all. It's also the first time that the character of the Red Skull was a result of the same experiment that created Captain America, a concept reused in the MCU version decades later. Starring Matt Salinger, who is completely unconvincing as a strong heroic lead, its failure probably set Marvel movies back by almost a decade. The 1986 film Howard the Duck had a decent cast and the right people behind it, but there was little that could save this disaster of a movie. Howard is an awkward, anthropomorphic duck from another world who finds himself transported to planet Earth. Once in Cleveland, Howard gets involved with a young punk rocker named Beverly. Do you think I might find happiness in the animal kingdom, Ducky? Like they say, Dal, love's strange. While trapped on Earth, Howard becomes a manager of Beverly's band Cherry Bomb before scientists reveal that their new invention is what accidentally brought him to Earth. But in an attempt to send Howard back, they bring the villainous Dark Overlord to Earth, too. If that premise makes little sense to you, you're not alone, as it was a flop of critics, audiences, and at the box office. A spin-off of 2003's Daredevil, the 2005 disaster Electro was a starring vehicle for Jennifer Garner that was somehow greenlit despite the previous film's poor reception. Back from the dead in a revealing red corset, Elektra now acts as an assassin for hire, with new superpowers that include precognition and the ability to resurrect the dead. No, we're not joking. Despite a strong cast and a big budget, Hollywood just hadn't figured out how to write a female superhero at this point. Instead of an exciting action movie, we got a watered-down copy of another bad superhero movie. While Elektra is slickly produced, it's borderline unwatchable with no charms at all. Despite terrible reviews, the 2007 film Ghost Rider nevertheless was a modest hit, grossing more than $200 million. To the producer's credit, they clearly saw that there were problems with the film, so instead of forging ahead with the sequel straight away, they took their time to craft something with a new, darker, grittier, more-in-your-face approach. Somehow, the sequel was even worse anyway. Nicolas Cage returned as Ghost Rider, doing battle with the devil over the soul of a young boy. Unfortunately, the tone of the film went from gritty to goofy faster than Ghost Rider's Hell Cycle. Hey, what if you have to pee while you're on fire? Oh, it's awesome. It's like a flamethrower. Cage blamed its failure on the studio's unwillingness to embrace an R rating. Roasted by critics even more than the first movie, Spirit of Vengeance killed the series for good. The latest entry in Sony's Spider-Man universe, 2022's Morbius, was a true flop, seeming to prove once again that without Marvel Studios' help, Sony has no idea what to do with their corner of the Marvel Universe. Starring Jared Leto, Morbius tells the story of a scientist working on a cure for a debilitating genetic disorder, but the cure inadvertently turns him into a blood-sucking vampire. Pursued by the FBI, Morbius discovers he's not the only one who has gained vampiric powers, setting him up for what was surely intended to be an epic final showdown. Sadly, the movie was mocked for its lameness and for being more reminiscent of early 2000s superhero movies than anything from the MCU. It had surprisingly bad effects, hammy acting, and a nonsensical plot. Perhaps in the years to come, we'll look back on this as an oddity, but for now, it seems like a bad omen for Sony's Spider-Man universe. Nicolas Cage, who'd been circling superhero roles for years, finally found his franchise in 2007, taking on the role of Johnny Blaze, a daredevil motorcycle rider who strikes a deal with the literal devil to save his father's life. Now, Blaze is cursed to walk the Earth as Ghost Rider, where he battles the demon Blackheart in an attempt to regain his mortal soul. The film boasted a strong cast, but the horror was undercut by a PG-13 rating. Ultimately, the film failed to capture the visceral horror and grim tone of the flame-wielding bounty hunter. Still, it did serviceable numbers at the box office, enough that it enticed the studio to try again four years later with predictable results. 
The third attempt to get the Punisher right on the big screen, Punisher Warzone, is somehow the worst of the three films that feature Marvel's gun-toting vigilante. While the first wasn't enough Punisher and the second was a bit too tame, this one strikes all the wrong notes. With borderline campy action and a paper-thin plot that doesn't stack up to even the worst of generic action movies. Star Ray Stevenson does perhaps the most faithful interpretation of Frank Castle to date, waging his never-ending one-man war in an attempt to get revenge for the death of his family. Despite being made after Marvel Studios had shown them how to do comic book movies right, there's little to like about this one. One of the most famous unseen movies in Hollywood history, the 1994 adaptation of Marvel's The Fantastic Four, was produced by schlock tour Roger Corman. Made on a shoestring budget only so the studio could fulfill a contract and keep the rights, it was never intended to be shown in theaters, though nobody on the production knew that at the time. Like its comic book counterpart, it tells the origin story of four friends who venture into outer space and are granted incredible superpowers. Suiting up as a superhero team, they clash with the metal-suited tyrant Doctor Doom. A stale script and downright awful effects make it a chore to sit through, but it's clear that it was made with earnestness by the filmmakers and especially the cast, who you can tell are putting their heart and soul into the movie. That, combined with the fascinating history of the film and its place in Marvel's ascent to Hollywood dominance, make it worth watching as a curious historical relic. Doom, it's clobbering time. The third film in the Blade trilogy couldn't quite match the uniqueness of the first two, as 2004's Blade Trinity slipped into farce. Full of action movie tropes and with a cast who seem like they're just going through the motions, save for Ryan Reynolds, who seems to enjoy hamming it up, it all adds up to one of the most disappointing movies Marvel has ever been involved with. Even Wesley Snipes himself had problems with the final product, resulting in a legal feud between Snipes and the studio. Snipes was also dogged for years with accusations of unprofessional behavior on set. Unfortunately, Trinity marked a sad end to the promising Blade trilogy and sent Snipes out of his fan-favorite role on an extremely sour note. By 2004, it had been 15 years since Hollywood had attempted a movie version of The Punisher, and it seemed like the perfect time to finally get it right. The new version, starring Thomas Jane, was based on a comic book run by Preacher creator Garth Ennis, with Armageddon writer-turned-director Jonathan Hensley behind the camera. While The Punisher is a compelling depiction of the character, it largely lacks the grim, dark tone that Frank Castle's story requires. It seems the studio, despite the R rating, wasn't ready to head down such a bleak path. Even though Jane himself became a fan favorite in the role for his intense performance, the movie disappointed and led to two reboots over the course of the next decade. The final film in Fox's two-decade-long X-Men saga, 2019's X-Men Dark Phoenix, sent the franchise out on a low note. Wasting a perfectly good cast, the film tells the story of the Dark Phoenix, which had been told already in the 2006 film X-Men 3 The Last Stand. In this version, the X-Men head into space where telepath Jean Grey is possessed by the cosmic Phoenix Force. Turned into a diabolical weapon by a race of alien planet conquerors, the X-Men must come back together to save the world and their friend. Rumors swirled that the film was altered late in development after the MCU's Captain Marvel was announced to avoid comparisons, and that Disney's purchase of Fox led the studio to make even more changes to the project. Whatever the reason, X-Men Dark Phoenix wasn't just the last proper X-Men film from Fox, it was also the worst. Produced by Fox before their merger with Disney and delayed multiple times for a variety of reasons, The New Mutants was filmed in 2017 but didn't hit theaters until 2020. It was a unique film that had more in common with the supernatural horror hit Stranger Things than superhero comic book adventure films, even including one of that show's many stars. The movie introduced five young mutants, Mirage, Wolfsbane, Cannonball, Sunspot, and Magic, as they told their stories to a doctor. Held in a secret facility ostensibly for the purpose of curing them of their dangerous mutant powers, their visions soon come to life and threaten to kill them all. Its fresh concept as a supernatural thriller gets it some credit, but the much-hyped film was a big disappointment, considering how long it had waited to be seen. More than a decade after the low-budget adaptation from Roger Corman, the Fantastic Four got the big-budget, big-screen treatment they deserved in 2005. The film had a strong cast and good special effects, and told the story right from the beginning, with the four friends venturing into space and receiving incredible powers. Ben Grimm became the super-strong thing, Sue Storm could turn invisible, Reed Richards could stretch his body to ungodly proportions, and the hot-headed Johnny Storm could flame on and shoot fire from his fingertips. Together, they battled the villainous Doctor Doom, a former rival of Richards, now with his own powers and bent on destruction. The film was colorful, upbeat, and adventurous, striking the perfect tone for the comic book adaptation of Marvel's first super team. Unfortunately, the script left a lot to be desired, getting too hokey in places. A lighthearted romp, it didn't deliver the high-octane comic book action that fans had come to expect from recent X-Men and Spider-Man films. It's clobbering time! It's catchy, right? 
The first four ray back into the live-action Spider-Verse after their team-up with Marvel Studios, the 2018 action movie Venom looked like a return to form for Sony. Starring Tom Hardy in the title role and heading down darker, more mature territory than ever before, the film looked to be a real treat for comic book fans looking for a better take on the character than Topher Grace's incarnation from Spider-Man 3. A big-budget barn burner, Venom lit up the box office, taking in a whopping $856 million during its run. Full of just the right amount of over-the-top action, violence, and gore that fans have been craving, it was a genuine crowd-pleaser, especially Hardy's madcap, unhinged performance. By looking past those delights, Venom simply doesn't have much to offer in the way of a powerful or satisfying story, turning out to be little more than a loud, mindless romp. You will be this armless, legless, faceless thing, won't you? Rolling down the street like a turd in the wind. With Marvel Studios' MCU off and running, Fox wanted to revive their Fantastic Four franchise and capitalize on the public's hunger for superheroes. Enter young indie director Josh Trank, who had in mind a horror-inspired new take on Marvel's first family for the 2015 reboot. He wanted to make a more grounded, realistic, and grittier vision that saw the four young adults discover an alternate dimension that inadvertently gives them superpowers, including their friend Victor Von Doom, who uses them for evil. In perhaps one of the worst cases of a studio completely bungling a movie, Fox butchered Trank's concept and reshot much of the film with a different director. While Trank's darker, grittier version of the Fantastic Four may have been misguided, we'll never know what could have been had he actually been able to see it through. As it stands, there's some intriguing ideas and some compelling drama, but the film completely falls apart in the second half, and the reshoots are terribly obvious, thanks to some bad green screen effects and an oddly chosen blonde wig from Mara Sue Storm. A step up from its predecessor, the 2007 sequel Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer added another major Marvel character to the mix. The Silver Surfer gave the film an exciting new quasi-villain to pair with the returning Doctor Doom, who seeks to control the cosmic power wielded by the newly arrived alien. But the Silver Surfer is more than a mere foe. He arrives as a harbinger of the world's end as the herald of his master, the being known as Galactus, who is on his way to devour the planet. A marked improvement over the first movie, the deepening of the FF lore served the film well, and the cast did even better work the second time around. But once more, the story doesn't come across as particularly exciting. Likewise, the changes made to Galactus fall completely flat, even for audiences unfamiliar with the source material. It's not quite a bad film, but the rise of the Silver Surfer once again feels like a big wasted opportunity for some of Marvel's best characters, Stan Lee included. Name? Stan Lee. Yeah, uh, nice try, buddy. Nice no, no, try. really, uh, nice I'm try. Stan yeah. Lee. Fresh off his turn as Jack Ryan in The Sum of All Fears, rising action star Ben Affleck donned the red cowl in 2003's Daredevil. Joining him were Jennifer Garner and Colin Farrell as antagonists Elektra and Bullseye, respectively, as well as John Favreau as Matt's law partner Foggy Nelson. Adapting both Daredevil's origin story as well as elements from some of the characters' best runs, the film seemed to run through Daredevil's greatest hits rather than tell a single compelling story. Despite some good performances and some decent stunt work, the film simply isn't as dark as it clearly wants to be, never fully embracing the seriousness of the gritty source material it's adapting. Thankfully, an extended director's cut helped smooth out its rough edges, but it still didn't do justice to the character's rich comic book adventures. Like The Punisher, it would be rebooted a decade later with a much more faithful Netflix series. 1989's The Punisher was the first adaptation of the character for the screen. Starring Rocky IV villain Dolph Lundgren, it tells the story of Frank Castle, a former police detective who was thought dead in the mafia hit that killed his family. Bitter, resentful, and full of bloodthirsty rage, Castle makes it his personal mission to strike back against the city's biggest criminals. Known to the underworld as the Punisher, he has done serious damage to a number of crime families, and now has his sights set on the Yakuza, the Japanese criminal enterprise that's infiltrated New York. Though the film is not the most faithful adaptation of the character, it operates more as an average action film for its day. And while fans may have wanted something dark and violent, the movie is bleak and grim to the point of being depressing. Lundgren is a satisfying punisher in places, but the film is mostly let down by a cliched story and lame action scenes. Little of it lives up to what audiences had come to expect from other better revenge films in the 80s. As a relic of an older time, though, it's become a cult favorite. It may be a surprise for some, but the 2016 MCU entry Doctor Strange wasn't the first time Marvel took a stab at a film based on the Sorcerer Supreme. Way back in 1978, Doctor Strange aired on American TV screens as an event film in primetime. Starring Peter Hooten and Jessica Walter, the film follows Doctor Stephen Strange from his humble beginnings to his training as Master of the Mystic Arts. The film takes quite a few liberties from the character's comic book origins, though. In this version, Strange is a psychiatrist working with a troubled young woman who is under the influence of the medieval spellcaster Morgan Le 
Lefay. In the process of trying to help her, Strange ends up becoming the Sorcerer Supreme to face down Lefay. Though certainly a flawed film, if you can look past the dated production and the notable differences from the comics, Doctor Strange is a lightweight fantasy adventure that should delight diehard fans of Marvel's Resident Wizard. Following three hit X-Men films where Hugh Jackman proved a standout as the hero Wolverine, Fox finally gave him his own film. 2010's X-Men Origins Wolverine took a trip back in time to show how Logan became the famed mutant with unbreakable claws. Your country needs you. I'm Canadian. It turns out he and his brother were born in 19th century Canada and fought in numerous wars together before being recruited to a secret government organization. When Victor goes rogue and kills Logan's only love, Logan undergoes the experimental procedure that bonds the unbreakable alloy adamantium to his bones in order to hunt down his brother. X-Men Origins Wolverine has plenty of thrilling action set pieces and some intriguing new characters, but disappoints with lackluster CGI, a clumsy story, and confusing connections to the larger X-Men universe. It's also infamous for co-starring Ryan Reynolds' first appearance as Wade Wilson, later known as Deadpool, and totally butchering the character, something they even made fun of in the Deadpool 2 post credits scene. Even if the first Venom film in 2016 wasn't loved by critics, its massive haul at the box office was more than enough to earn it a sequel. Woody Harrelson had already teased the villain Carnage, and with Tom Hardy back on board and Andy Serkis coming on board to direct, it had all the ingredients for another smash success. And it was a hit, thanks to a bigger and crazier villain, bigger stakes, and bigger and bloodier action. In the film, reporter Eddie Brock gets an interview with convicted serial killer Cletus Cassidy, and unwittingly gives him a portion of the Venom symbiote. Merged with the deranged madman, they become the homicidal supervillain Carnage, and it's up to Brock and his Venom personality to work together to stop his reign of terror. Let There Be Carnage is mostly mindless chaos and violence, and in that, it succeeds. But its thin characters and a thinner, unimaginative story make it a chore to sit through if you're looking for anything more. Time to die! That's the spirit! I mean us! We are going to die! Coming out just two years after the success of X-Men Days of Future Past, 2016's X-Men Apocalypse went further down the rabbit hole of X-Men lore, introducing the ancient being known as Apocalypse, who is said to have been mankind's first mutant. Facing a diabolical threat unlike anything they've seen before, the X-Men regroup to stop Apocalypse and his four horsemen. Though it gets credit for its ambitious premise, Apocalypse was a big letdown. Instead of the gripping, dramatic story and engaging characters we got in Days of Future Past, its sequel devolves into straight-action schlock, and an excellent cast is wasted. Ultimately, it's a film that looks great on paper but doesn't translate to the screen. But another memorable slow-motion Quicksilver set piece helps bump this one up a little higher on this list. The sequel to the reboot The Amazing Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield's return as the web-slinger in 2014 was in some ways an improvement over the first installment. Spidey is back in action, saving New York City from evildoers, including an emerging threat known as Electro, a down-on-his-luck technician who's granted superpowers when he falls into a tank of electric eels. And when his best friend Harry Osborn becomes a twisted goblin batty himself, Parker uncovers a vast conspiracy out of the Oscorp labs. While it certainly looked better than the first one, the sloppy mishmash plot brought the whole endeavor crashing down. There's quite a few bright spots in the movie, but not enough to keep it afloat, and despite pulling in some serious box office numbers, it was a disappointment for the studio. One silver lining, though, its lack of success partially led to Sony's deal with Marvel, and the introduction of Tom Holland in the MCU as a newly rebooted wall crawler. For the Hulk's 2003 big-screen debut, Universal and Marvel went outside the box and tapped director Ang Lee to bring Bruce Banner and his big green alter ego to life. Following the accident that turns him into the Hulk, Banner finds himself hunted by the U.S. military, all while contending with his father who now possesses powerful abilities of his own. Ang Lee brought a certain seriousness to the project, attempting to turn the story of Bruce Banner into something of a Shakespearean tragedy. When it works, it really works, and the film's stellar cast do some excellent work. But Lee's insistence on turning the visuals into a comic book farce lets the film down, with odd CGI that turned the towering Hulk into a foolish cartoon character in parts. Meanwhile, a clunky final act and a murky battle with a nebulous villain leaves much to be desired. 1998's Blade set the standard for fast-paced kung fu comic book action in America, complete with black leather jackets and a rapid-fire techno-driven soundtrack. The story begins with half-human, half-vampire Blade, played by Wesley Snipes, serving as a vampire-hunting mercenary. Along with his sidekick Whistler, the hero tracks and hunts the newly emerged vampire leader Deacon Frost, who seeks to eliminate the human race by summoning forth an ancient evil. Terribly dated today, it was an impressive roller coaster ride at the time. The influence of the film cannot be overstated either, as it was more than just a trendsetter in tone and style for late 90s action movies that would follow. Blade also proved to Hollywood that a relatively obscure superhero with a charismatic star and some clever, fast-paced action could become a big hit with audiences. 
When a superhero action movie ends up a surprise hit, you can bet you'll get a sequel, and that's exactly what happened with Blade. With a new director in the form of Guillermo del Toro, Blade 2 came out of the shadows and bit the necks of audiences everywhere in 2002. Like any good sequel, the good got better, including even more impressive action and a great cast. Blade 2 one-upped its predecessor in almost every area, but once again falls victim to some of the same flaws as the original. A thin story and weak characters make it another action-first movie, meant merely to overwhelm the senses with impressive fight scenes, kung fu choreography, and blazing shootouts, which it does. The third in the first X-Men movie trilogy, 2006's X-Men 3 The Last Stand, was not up to the standards of the first two films, but still manages to impress in a few places. The film opens with a clever flashback that utilizes one of the earliest instances of digital de-aging. It's here we discover that Professor X and Magneto have been manipulating telepath Jean Grey all her life in the hopes of keeping her overwhelming telepathic powers from destroying herself and everyone around her. Flash forward years later, and the government has developed a cure for the mutant gene. In defiance, Magneto recruits an army of mutants to fight back and unleashes the power of Jean Grey's Phoenix personality. Despite some strong new casting choices and some compelling new ideas thrown into the mix, the threequel was a haphazardly assembled over-the-top action film. Its trite, overstuffed script lacked much of the heart and soul of the previous movies. Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, however, remains as impressive as ever. Despite acclaimed director Sam Raimi reuniting with the cast of the first two films, 2007 Spider-Man 3 was a low point for the original Spider-Man trilogy. Here, Peter Parker continues dealing his double life as a crime-fighting wall crawler, while his best friend Harry Osborn, still blaming Spider-Man for the death of his father, suits up as a new goblin and sets out for revenge. Meanwhile, Peter discovers an alien ooze that grafts itself to his costume, making him more powerful than ever, but also twists him into a darker, unleashed man, jeopardizing his relationship with Mary Jane. And of course, that ooze turns out to be the symbiote called Venom. You made me lose my girl. Now I'm gonna make you lose yours. How's that sound, Tiger? If all of this sounds like a lot, you'd be right. And while the movie was the biggest yet, in terms of box office dollars, its jumbled mess of a plot and too too many villains holds it back from greatness. Thomas Hayden Church, however, is inspired as Sandman. While the movie disappoints, both he and McGuire would return 15 years later for some redemption in Spider-Man No Way Home. Sony forged ahead with a full reboot of the franchise with 2012's The Amazing Spider-Man, after the plug was pulled on a Sam Raimi-directed Spider-Man 4. British actor Andrew Garfield took up the mantle as the old webhead, and rising star Emma Stone played Parker's high school sweetheart Gwen Stacy. In this new, darker origin story, we learn that the spider bite that gave Parker his powers was no accident, and that his parents, thought dead years before, may have been leading a secret double life. After he becomes the Amazing Spider-Man, he clashes with the monstrous lizard who seeks to turn the entire city into his own kind. Though only a marginal step up from Spider-Man 3, what really inspired audiences was the promise it held for the future of the franchise. Garfield proved himself as a different kind of Peter Parker and a funnier Spider-Man. With the backstory of the Parkers, Oscorp, and several other factors, this exciting new world was filled with potential. Sadly, the sequel would be a huge step down, and the potential would go unfulfilled. With star Hugh Jackman back as Logan, 2013's The Wolverine was a self-titled follow-up to X-Men Origins Wolverine. Starting out with a flashback to World War II, we see Logan saving the life of a Japanese man named Ichiro. In the present, Logan is visited by a mysterious mutant woman named Yukio, who wants him to come to Japan, where Ichiro lays dying. After all these years, Ichiro believes he's found a way to transfer Logan's healing powers to himself. But while in Japan, Logan is drawn into Ichiro's conflict with the Yakuza after they attempt to kidnap his granddaughter. A complex thriller that finally gives Wolverine a worthy story all his own, nods to the character's comic book adventures in Japan were well served. The movie's biggest flaw is a disjointed, sloppy ending that leans heavily on bad comic book movie cliches. Still, up until the hokey final battle, the film expertly injects some pathos into the character's solo series. For decades, fans have been dreaming of a big-budget X-Men movie. Well, in 2000, they got it. Unlike anything fans had seen before, full of the best comic book action ever seen, mixed with heartfelt drama, X-Men proved to be a groundbreaking comic book movie. More than just a pioneering superhero film, it kickstarted the boom in superhero movies that would follow. Though it took quite a bit of leeway with the source material, it got the core of the X-Men right, as an allegory for bigotry and racism. It also turned Hugh Jackman into a star and put him into the signature role that he'd played for nearly 20 years. It spawned a billion-dollar global franchise, and it's not an understatement to say that the MCU might not have ever existed without it, as it was on X-Men that MCU head Kevin Feige got his start as a fledgling producer. 
Ryan Reynolds returned to star in 2018's Deadpool 2, and this time he had a bigger budget and even more wisecracks in his arsenal. The action starts when a mysterious cybernetic mutant warrior called Cable arrives from the future in search of a young boy who will one day become a terrible villain. And then, predictably, everything goes straight to hell when Deadpool gets involved. Every bit as sharp, wild, and hilarious as the first film, Deadpool 2 expands on the adventure with more characters and even better villains. New characters Domino and Cable shined, and Reynolds once more proved why he and he alone was born to play Deadpool, delivering his trademark vulgar wit, abrasive sarcasm, and fourth-wall-breaking gags. A bigger budget and more varied action were improvements, but no matter how good, the sequel still couldn't match the freshness of the unexpected first film. Still, it proved an even bigger box office smash, easily securing a third movie in the series. 2003's X2 X-Men United wasted no time in showing how it could top the original X-Men film. An impressive opening action sequence saw new mutant Nightcrawler using his fantastic teleporting powers to infiltrate the White House in an attempt to assassinate the U.S. president. Thankfully, he fails, and the X-Men take in the blue-skinned outcast mutant, who had been brainwashed. But now the government is afraid of them. Military commandos invade the X-Men's home leading to one of the best sequences in all the X-Men films. With even bigger action and more spectacular special effects, plus new team members like Iceman and a renewed focus on the origins of Hugh Jackman's Wolverine, X2 X-Men United impressed. With a bigger box office haul and even better reviews, the film was, and remains, a clear favorite among critics and audiences alike. Part reboot, part prequel to the X-Men franchise, director Matthew Vaughn brought the series back with an all-new cast with the 2011 film X-Men First Class. Starring James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender as younger versions of Professor X and Magneto, the film chronicled their early friendship turned rivalry, culminating in an epic showdown on land, sea, and the air. A smaller, more modest film than the earlier X movies, First Class refrained from the over-the-top action for a strong character-driven story led by its exceptional cast. The result was a critically well-received hit that led to four sequels and reinvigorated the franchise for a whole new generation. It also introduced many audiences to Jennifer Lawrence, who, like Jackman before her, leveraged the X-Men movies into superstardom. The 2016 film Deadpool was stuck in development hell after the disappointing first appearance for the character in X-Men Origins Wolverine years earlier. Leaked test footage that was met with thundering applause from fans forced the studio into production. And a good thing, too, because it turned out to be a surprise smash hit and the highest grossing R-rated movie ever. Ryan Reynolds plays Devil May Care mercenary Wade Wilson, who is diagnosed with terminal cancer. Volunteering for an experiment run by a shadowy government agency, Wilson becomes Deadpool, an unstoppable mutant assassin who's impossible to kill. But when Deadpool breaks free of their control, they take his girlfriend hostage, and Deadpool has to turn to the X-Men for help. Fast, funny, and imaginative, it was a groundbreaking superhero movie that got everyone in the industry rethinking the possibilities for R-rated comic book movies. 2002 Spider-Man delivered audiences the first big-budget live-action adaptation of the world's famous web-slinger, and did it with poise. Directed by horror icon Sam Raimi and boasting an excellent cast, it delivered just the kind of colorful superhero adventure that audiences hadn't seen in decades. The film told Spider-Man's classic origin story. High school student Peter Parker is bitten by a genetically engineered spider and receives incredible powers. But when he fails to prevent the murder of his beloved Uncle Ben, Peter learns… well, you know what he learns. With great power comes great responsibility. A true blockbuster, it broke records, becoming the first movie to ever earn more than $100 million on its opening weekend. It led to two sequels and made McGuire the definitive Spider-Man for more than a generation. 2014's X-Men Days of Future Past begins in a dystopian future where the government has cracked down on mutants. Wolverine is sent back in time where he must bring together the younger X-Men with their enemies to stop a plot that will ultimately lead to the near extermination of all mutants. Combining both casts with Wolverine leading the story proved a triumph. A popcorn flick with surprising charm and heart, X-Men Days of Future Past is a breezy, effortless action adventure. Its several stunning action sequences, including the introduction of the super-speedy mutant Quicksilver, made Days of Future Past the most unforgettable movie in the series. The perfect example of a sequel that outdoes an already great original, 2004 Spider-Man 2 brought back the cast and crew of the previous film, pitting the hero against perhaps the most well-known of the wall crawler's famous rogues gallery, the robotic-armed Dr. Octopus. Played by veteran actor Alfred Molina, Doc Ock came alive as a charismatic scientist on an obsessive quest to prove his revolutionary theories, and willing to kill to do it. Even more than the original, Spider-Man 2 set the standard by which all future superhero comic book films would be judged. Molina's sly, devilish Dr. Octopus became a blueprint for later villains, the baddie with a misguided quest. And Sam Raimi's direction, amped up from the prior film, proved comic book films could embrace a little scariness. Even noted critic Roger Ebert, notoriously hard on comic 
comic book films of the day gave the film four stars, saying simply, this is what a superhero movie should be. I gotta tell you, Spider-Man 2 just may be the best superhero movie I have ever seen. While most superhero films are bombastic adventures, Logan, by contrast, is a dark, sobering drama about an aging, hopeless man looking for meaning. In a not-too-distant, bleak future, mutants have become outlaws, and Logan is tired of running. But when he comes across a lost little girl named Laura, he's forced to embrace his inner hero once again, and vows to keep her safe. In what would be his final performance in the role, Hugh Jackman delivers a tour de force as the eponymous hero. Logan has a realness and intensity thanks to its soulful characters and powerful performances. Emotionally resonant and moving in a way that transcends the superhero comic book movie genre is not just the best non-MCU movie from Marvel, it may very well be the best Marvel Marvel movie ever made. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite films are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.